Hi everybody, my name is Brady and we are back with another React video and today we're going to be doing more extra history. Turns out I was onto something last time, I mean they couldn't have made it more obvious. Uh, this is the first extra history series, which is really cool. We're doing the Punic Wars part two. If you want to watch part one, I have a whole extra history playlist on my channel. You can check that out. But I kind of like the idea of doing their series from the beginning. It'll force me to take on new topics and stuff. And that's one thing about this channel that really excites me. Um, as far as Roman history goes, I know surprisingly little, but from what I'm getting here, the Punic Wars is pretty fundamental to establishing the direction of Western civilization as we know it, which is pretty cool. It's pretty cool. And uh, maybe I can learn a thing or two here. The, with it being so condensed, you can only learn so much, but it's a decent foundational piece for something that I don't typically have to deal with ever as far as the history I study goes. But yeah, this should be cool. Let's uh, get it started. Turn Let's that have up some a little. more Roman history, shall we? When we left off last time, Hamilcar's son Hannibal controlled a powerful army expanding the Carthaginian territory in the Iberian Peninsula. Today, we begin the Second Punic War itself. Hannibal's campaign in Iberia was slowly taking his army ever northward. Eventually, his territory expanded dangerously near to the Ebro River, which the previous mm. Carthaginian ruler in Spain had established as the border where Carthaginian influence ended and Roman influence began. Obviously, the Romans were not fans of this development, but here's where it gets murky. To this day, historians can't agree on which river the Ebro River referred to in the treaty actually is, which oh. makes interpreting what happens next simply a matter of deciding who you believe. You see, there was a Greek colony in northern Spain called Saguntum. It was a prosperous trading city and- Before we get into this, this- This is a dilemma that I get into everyone's- Sometimes I make statements that reflect a certain side of historical thought, uh, However, there is another one, and sometimes I'll just think, like, this is the side I believe, and I'll say it all willy-nilly and not even put uh, consideration into, like, a whole nother branch of thought on a topic, and people will call me out for being wrong, but it's like, maybe, I, I might be wrong, but uh, it just seemed like the most plausible theory on the subject. So, like, I'm not at all surprised by this, and it's even murkier the further you go back in history. If there's confusion and stuff as recent as the 19th century, I mean, I can only imagine how difficult it is to study ancient history. Because it's completely different in the way that you approach it. The, the wealth of sources is just totally different. Let me go back a little. You see, there was a Greek colony in northern Spain called Saguntum. It was a prosperous trading city, and they had recently signed a treaty with Rome. The Romans claimed that, according to the Ebro River Treaty, this city was sacrosanct and under their protection. But Hannibal claimed it was on the wrong side of the river, and therefore part of his territory. Hmm. The year is 219 BC. Hannibal is 26 years old, and he remembers the oath his father made him take. Never be a friend to Rome. Oof. So he attacks, laying siege to the city, rebuking the Roman embassies that come to him for all the wrongs Rome has done Carthage. For eight months, the Saguntines hold out, all the while pleading to Rome for help, begging their ally to come save them from what, without aid, is their certain doom. But Ooh. Rome sent no troops. They had recently become embroiled in a war in Illyria, the Balkan region north of Greece, so okay. <laughs> never sent the aid the Saguntines were counting on. They a, a lot of the terminology and, like, the names of these places as they are during this time is also going to be very unfamiliar, so I'm glad he, uh, he uh, lays that out. Not only is this not... Uh, the time period I'm used to, it's also geographically very different from what I'm used to. While I do encounter a lot of European history, um, it's not even the same part of Europe. It's a completely different time. So there's, there's just so much that is just foreign here. And that's why I find this hard to learn from in like a deep way, because I feel like I need so much more time put into every little detail because I don't have a really, really good foundation to work off of. Figuring that Saguntum could hold out on its own until their own Balkan War was done. But Hannibal's forces were too much for them. At long last, with the Saguntum population starving and the defenders falling back from outer wall to inner wall to the citadel of the city itself, Hannibal emerged victorious and his army pillaged dope. the city, selling into slavery everybody they didn't kill. That's not now, dope. Now, this is the Sorry. point where Rome might have been able to prevent the Second Punic War. Might have nipped it in the bud, but by not acting on their treaty and not rescuing their ally, they brought 20 years of unimaginable war upon the Mediterranean. <sighs> 
When Saguntum fell, Rome sent an emissary to Carthage to offer them a choice. Surrender Hannibal to Rome, or face war. The emissary stood before the Carthaginian Senate, surrounded by all the great men of Carthage, and said to them, I hold before you both peace and war. The leader of the Senate spat back, choose what you will. The envoy replied, I choose war. I am fascinated by the Senate. I know this is like a broad history and it's going to have be very uh, military based. And I can tell by the way, like he takes on the geography of things that this is going to really work well to explaining the military stuff. I want to know how the Senate functioned. I, I know there are really cool uh, videos on this sort of stuff from other creators that cover like er early governments and how they related to like the modern day governments. And, and like, I would love to learn a little bit more about that. So if anybody has any specific creators who cover that sort of thing, let me know. I already have uh, one or two in mind, uh, but there might be plenty of people who float under my radar because I'm not paying very good attention. And the entire chamber exploded with shouts of, we accept it, and now it's on. Hannibal's off the leash. The Second Punic War has begun. The Romans hmm. begin to prepare for war. They send an army down to Sicily with one of their consuls to get ready for an invasion of Carthage in North Africa. And they send their other consul off with an army to invade Iberia and capture Carthaginian holdings there, leaving a small force of recruits to make sure that the Gauls in northern Italy don't take this as an opportunity to cause mischief while the bulk of the military is away. And hmm. now is probably a good time to take a moment to talk a little bit about Roman politics, because it's going to become very yes, important please. in a second. You see, in Rome, each year they would elect two consuls to be the heads of state. These guys would function more or less like the U.S. president, except that they okay. each had veto power over the other. And unlike the president, who oh. is supreme commander of the U.S. military but doesn't actually fight on the ground, these guys would also be the ones to lead the Roman armies into battle. So that probably influenced partisanship significantly, I'd imagine. If it was a very divided country partisan-wise, you really wouldn't be able to get a whole lot done. And I, I kind of wonder how that functions. It's like, what if we had, like, a Democrat president and a Republican president at the same time? And they could both veto each other. We'd, we'd be probably in a lot of trouble. Unless there was, like, some sort of override there and it could be implemented effectively, which I doubt. So, I'd imagine, party-wise, I, I can't imagine they were that divided i can't imagine that uh partisanship was too heated at the time for them to function effectively they were very much the generals on the ground choosing the strategies and directing the battles of course they okay. weren't amateurs in this you had to have 10 years of military service to even be eligible for the lowest political office in rome oh really we're gonna see how politics affect this war pretty soon for now i had somebody i i remember a, a while ago who made the argument to me uh that people sh should have to serve in the military to hold public office. I thought, like, no, there's there's a million other skills one can have for that. But I, I've actually had somebody make the argument recently for a system a little closer to that, where uh, you really put the emphasis on military. Um, there might be some flaws in focusing too much on military. You'd build a very specific kind of foreign policy out of uh, a government filled with militarily minded people. There's there's definitely a lot of other factors that go into play, and it's good to keep it diverse. It is great to have people with military experience uh, calling the shots in major positions, like the presidency. I I I, I think uh, having military experience it definitely is a plus for running for president. So, you know, it's it's interesting. I just I just remember that conversation though so vividly. Now back to Hannibal. Hannibal is a clever guy. He realizes that trying to defend North Africa is a losing proposition, and he knows that fighting on his own turf in Iberia will only result in a slow defeat. So he plans yeah. to do the unthinkable Sorry. and invade Italy by crossing the Alps. Now, of course, that's the one thing the Romans didn't plan for. The army they left in northern Italy is nothing but raw recruits and the dregs of their former forces. All of their real soldiers are either heading south to prepare for an African invasion or making the hmm. trek across what is now France to invade Spain. And oh. that's where the first skirmish of the war happens. That Spain and... You know, now that I think about it, this this still does encompass a lot of the Europe that I know. Um, it, it has France and, and Spain, you know. Like, not France and Spain as we know it, but geographically, yeah, it, do, it definitely does cover a lot of the Europe that 
I end up dealing with when I rarely do have to deal directly with Europe. Uh, what I cover is very America centric. Uh, mo- I think a big part of that is because I don't do a whole lot of uh, military history, so I don't have to think as much about what's going on over there. There's still plenty of stuff that's relevant uh, in other parts of the field, but I- I'd imagine that's a decent explanation why I'm not as familiar. Invasion force runs into Hannibal as he's making his way to the Alps, and their scouts clash. A few hundred cavalry from each side run into each other unexpectedly and come to blows. Mm. The Roman scouts manage to push back the Carthaginians. It's nothing decisive. The important thing is that they live to report this news back to their commander, Publius mm. Cornelius Scipio. You're going to want to remember that name, Scipio. You know how on the Carthaginian side... Okay, yeah, that's the... One of you said in the comments of the previous video, you mentioned Scipio, and I, I knew that name. I totally know that name, and... Uh, you mentioned that it was from a Nerd Cubed video. Uh, I can't believe, like a long time ago, Nerd Cube, he did a series on uh, a WWE game. It might have been 2K16, and his custom wrestler was Scipio. He like created like this Roman character, and it sounds like such a fake name today, but that's actually really funny. That brings me back a little bit. I'm not even talking about history here. I'm, I'm just going down memory lane in this one. You have the sons of the great General Hamilcar from the last war fighting together on a blood oath they swore to their father to avenge the shame Carthage suffered at the hands of the Romans. Well, this guy is their Roman equivalent. This Scipio we just met will eventually Scipio. die on the field slain by Hannibal's armies, but his Aww. son will later crush Hannibal and turn the tide of the war, and his great-grandson Dope. will go on to sack Carthage and wipe them out forever, 70 years after the story we're telling. See, that's part of what makes the Second Punic War so epic. Blood oaths and vengeance, rivalry from two great houses, a war passed down from father to son, it's two really everything. vying for the fate of the world. It's awesome. And this battle is their first meeting where the whole rivalry begins. Scipio, now aware of Hannibal's invasion force, tries to give chase, but Hannibal manages to slip away. Without the resources or the logistics in place to do otherwise, Scipio makes the fateful decision to have his army press on towards Spain as planned, while he himself speeds back with all haste to rally the forces in northern Italy. Hannibal, mm. meanwhile, continues his march across France. The Romans expected him to be slowed down by hostile tribes, just like they always were when they tried to cross Gaul, but Hannibal is planned ahead, and he already offered the tribes generous gifts and the promise that his fury has only one target, Rome. Oh, that that's kind of cool. Like, they... Uh, I... That's one of those things I, w- I would really like to learn more about. Like, uh, the people of Gaul sound incredibly interesting. Um, I I always found them so... Like, I had a, uh, a class on the Middle Ages, which actually covered a, a lot of stuff even before the Middle Ages technically began. And uh, Gaul always seemed very interesting to me. And I'm not even completely sure why. Um, I, I mean, I haven't learned too much about them outside of that course. I have one book on, like, French cuisine that talked about some of the early, uh, food that people ate during the time, but outside of culinary history, I couldn't tell you much about Gaul. And the plan works, mostly. He does still get halted by the local forces once. At the Rhone River, a band of Gauls with Roman allegiances assemble an army on the far side, intending to prevent his crossing. Looks However, epic, unbeknownst man. to them, Hannibal has already sent one of his officers, Hanno, known as Hanno, son of Bomilcar, to differentiate him from Hannibal's own Bomilcar. son, also named Hanno, just to be perfectly confusing. Anyway, Hannibal already sent Hanno with some hand-picked troops to cross the river upstream. So Hannibal makes to cross, the Gauls assemble on the opposite bank to stop him, and then, just as planned, Hanno comes bursting out of hiding and assaults their forces from the rear, scattering the Gaul force and leaving the way open for Hannibal's army to continue their march. And haste was essential for Hannibal, as it was already September, and he had to get his army across the Alps before it got any colder. Even at this pace, the conditions they faced in the Alps were brutal. There is a reason why this march is one of the most famous events in military history, and why its audacity caught the Romans entirely by surprise. And that's because everyone thought it was impossible. There was no way you could march an army through the treacherous peaks of the Alps in the beginning of winter. It simply could not be done. Yeah, that sounds stupid, doesn't it? Like... Like, it's daring, and it succeeded, seemingly, which, good for them and all, but on the face of it, it does sound really stupid. I mean, maybe there's more to it. Maybe he he knew more than I did, or maybe it was dumb luck, I'm not sure, but wow. Like, I, 
I don't have to be super familiar with the geography to understand that how difficult this task was, or at least to understand it was difficult. He went and did it. He dismissed the less reliable members of his army at the foot of the Alps. And <laughs> really? The weather was brutal. Men froze to death. Mules fell from the frozen cliffs still laden with the army's food and supplies. Hill tribes attacked them and rolled boulders onto the narrow paths. Ice and snow beset them the whole way, and at times men had to crawl to make it along the tiny mountain track. But they did it. In the end, they made it to Italy. But the cost? By some accounts, Hannibal had 98,000 men when he started the climb, and only 26,000 when he set foot into Italy on the other side. Okay, that's kind of a failure. Um, I mean, really, it depends heavily on what happens afterwards, but that sort of cost in any case it, it it's going to have to it's going to take like a really huge victory to justify those losses but like apparently this is big apparently like i'd imagine they're going to score some big points out of this this you wouldn't have uh, just the way he's emphasizing it i guess it, it's foreshadowing uh them going for a big victory, but I, I don't know. That, that's a lot of death to justify. Upon reaching Italy, Hannibal gives his troops time to rest from the arduous crossing and tries to recruit the local Gauls to his cause, as they have no love for the Romans either. Meanwhile, Scipio is racing toward them with whatever handful of troops he can assemble, knowing full well what Hannibal intends. They meet and come to blows in a whirlwind cavalry engagement by the Tensino. The larger, better-trained Carthaginian cavalry dances circles around the Roman infantry and the few cavalry Scipio could muster. Mm. The engagement is small, but a decisive defeat for the Romans, a defeat in which Scipio was gravely wounded and would have lost his life oh. if it weren't for a heroic rescue by his then 18-year-old son fighting by his side, a man we will later know as Scipio Africanus. So Scipio oh, withdraw- okay. That's the one that uh, NerdCube had in, in his WWE gameplay. That's the one that he created as his custom guy. It was I, I remember that last name too, Africanus. Uh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Draws to recover and regroup. This skirmish may not have been a major victory for the Carthaginians, but it's an enormous boost to their morale after such a grueling journey, and the local Gauls, upon hearing of the battle, start to think Hannibal's army might have a chance, and they begin defecting in mass. But now Rome is worried. The other consul, Sempronius Longus, is recalled from Sicily, and he and his legions start marching north to join Scipio's battered command. When he arrives, Sempronius immediately starts pressing for an attack, but Scipio, having already seen Hannibal's army in action, cautions against it. Sempronius is eager, though, hot-headed and looking to brawl. He believes Scipio's caution is born of his wounds, and thinks him cowardly to not attempt to drive this invader from Roman soil. Scipio advises they use winter for training. As you'll remember, the men left in northern Italy were raw recruits, or the remnants of a previously defeated army. But here's where the Roman politics comes in. The next year's elections are drawing near, and Sempronius wants a glorious victory for his faction and his family before this term's done. He is not going to be denied this opportunity. Yeah, this sort of thing... (sighs) Like, when you mix politics and military... Like, they're inseparable, but there's always... And we have, like, a Republican government, which is definitely going to make a huge difference here. Um, If this was... uh, I don't know, if there was some sort of a dictatorship or whatever, I guess they wouldn't have to worry so much about that. But if we have somebody who, uh, I guess, is running that is hostile to the cause, maybe more in line with reconciliation, I I don't know. That that could definitely be a huge blow here. So I guess this is their chance to justify their the, the war, I guess, to show that it's a winning battle for them. Now, while each Roman consul is actually the supreme commander of his army, when two consuls are together, they alternate days for who is in charge of the whole thing. Are you Hannibal serious? knows this, and he also knows about Sempronius' temperament, which he uses to bait a trap. Early one morning, after sending his brother Mago with 2,000 hand-picked men to hide behind a small hill, Hannibal sends out a detachment of cavalry to harass the Roman army, who are camped just across the river Trebia. It's the winter solstice, one of the coldest days of the year. Sleet is pouring down, and the sun's just barely beginning to rise when this detachment is spotted. Sempronius orders the chase, and his men leap out of bed, throwing on their armor, and prepare to engage. The Carthaginian cavalry retreats across the river, and Sempronius gives chase. He orders his men to wade across the water. The men drag themselves to the other side in full armor, sometimes up to their necks in the freezing water. Once across, it's clear that Hannibal's willing to meet them in battle, so the troops are ordered to form up. 
Think about how long it would take to get 50,000 men organized and in formation with nothing but shouting and some flags. It takes hours. So here the men are, standing in the sleet, soaked from head to toe with frigid water, roused before dawn and launched into a chase without even time for a meal. It's probably been half a day since any of them have eaten. Meanwhile, oh. Hannibal let his men sleep in and had them around big roaring fires eating a hearty meal before forming up. Hmm. Now, to add to that, put yourself in the Romans' shoes for a moment. Imagine you're a provincial Roman farmer. The most you've seen of the world is maybe the length of Italy if you're really well-traveled. Yeah. Now, imagine that through the sleet and the mist, you see a great gray lumbering bulk begin to emerge. Oh, no. What this... What this series is showing me... Carthage is pretty rad. I I know it's 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 genius analysis or whatever. I I don't know anything about this stuff, but uh, Carthage is not something that comes to mind very often. I will think about Rome in the abstract because naturally Rome does lay the foundation for what Western civilization would end up becoming. Uh, the last time I thought about Carthage before watching this video series, I couldn't even tell you i i couldn't tell you three things about carthage before this I mean, this is gonna be sick i can already i it's an elephant right imagine you see this creature two and a half times as tall as you at least a chariot length long with glistening white tusks and a distended oh, snout it's that's eerie so trumpeting carrying cool. across to you faintly on the wind this is probably the closest that human beings ever got to legit fighting monsters. Fighting something so alien and gargantuan that there was no frame of reference for them. The average Italian had probably never even heard of an elephant, much less seen one Dude. before. So imagine lining up against that. I'd imagine this is a similar feeling to, like, the soldiers that saw the first tank. Like, assuming they didn't see it coming, I don't know what the first case... Maybe maybe in World War One, maybe... Maybe there's some sort of conflict before. I, I don't know who who saw the first tank. Uh, but I'd imagine it's a similar feeling. Probably scarier because the elephant being a living creature has like this air of, monst I guess, monstrousness, monstrosity. Yeah. And, and there's kind of an unpredictable element to that. Dude, technology is one thing, but this is this is kind of awesome. And knowing that you'll have to fight such a thing with just your short spear and your sword. Now, despite all of those disadvantages, the Roman infantry fared pretty well at first. Oh, for real? holding their own against the hodgepodge of Numidians, Celts, and Spaniards that faced them. But the exhausted Roman cavalry is driven off the field. The Numidian cavalry then wheels around and attacks the Roman flanks. At the same time, Mago's forces that have been so patiently laying in ambush spring onto the Roman rear and everything starts to collapse. Though Sempronius escapes with his life, the Romans' retreat leaves more than 25,000 dead. For the first time, the Romans oh. see this is going to be no easy war. Join us next time for the continuation of the Second Punic War. Thanks for watching. So they, didn't they, the Carth Carthaginians, like, start with, like, 25,000 or something? Because they lost, like, 70,000 or something? Dude, that, that's, that's pretty sick, though. Like, they killed pretty much the equivalent of what was left of their army. Hold on, is there anything else? I know, I, I know it's just outro stuff, probably, but... It's nice to let the credits roll, if you can. At least. Mm. Nope, well, that seems to be it. Okay. Uh, final thoughts. Um, I think this is... I've never been into military history... But I find the older stuff more fun. It's weird. We have so much technology and crazy whatever is going on uh, when it comes to military. I, I was never really interested in all that. I think the further back you go, the more fun I find military history to be. There is... It's both kind of abstract and concrete at the same time in the sense like... I can't relate to the technology at the time. Uh, I cannot relate to most things during that time. But uh, I I love how distant it is from us, in a sense. I, 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 I get it. Swords, spears, horses. And when elephants get involved, it, it's kind of crazy. And it's kind of awesome. 
uh, I I find that this sort of warfare a little bit more interesting. Uh, that that's just me though. Uh, it's still definitely not my thing. There are other things I would prefer to focus on, but this has been a very fun learning experience so far. And I hope you guys have enjoyed it too. Um, if you want to watch the rest of their series, I highly suggest you do. You don't have to wait for me to do it. Uh, yeah, this was cool. And uh, let me know other uh, series from Extra History you might want me to check out in the comment section below. I might just start going in order, like, like I said. Uh, I like the idea of... Uh, taking it since this is their first one i could just see what they have next on the list and go from there and get me out of my comfort zone learn some new things talk about things that don't necessarily relate to my area of study and see what my weird stuck in the 19th century brain uh has to say about things that are so far removed from that and it i feel so it feels like I'm learning history for the first time again, because I am, because I am. This is this is so far removed from what I do that it, it really is like starting from scratch, which is really cool. Um, so I'm all done. Like this video. If you like this video, subscribe for more and uh, leave suggestions in the comment section below. That's about it. Thank you.